Welcome back to the channel folks, my name's Shane. In today's video, I'm going to talk a little bit about an experience I had in 2008 playing live blues in Chicago. <laughs> That's right, I had a chance to live a little bit of a dream that I had at the time, which was playing in San Francisco. I went over to Austin, Texas, also played in Florida. But one of my big things was going to Chicago and playing electric blues, and I had a chance to do that. It was a great opportunity. So I'm going to sort of preface this by saying I always encourage anyone who watches my channel to go to the open mic nights, go to the blues jams, start playing outside of your house if it's possible. I know the world's a little bit upside down right now, but once things go back to normal or somewhat normal, get out there and start playing. It will make you a far better player. And the experiences are sometimes things that you can hold on to for the rest of your life. And this is one of those stories I want to share with you today. Sometime around April in 2008, I had a chance to see Buddy Guy live in Melbourne, Australia here in St Kilda. And I went with a few of my friends and Buddy actually gave me one of his picks. I was sitting there in the first row and I had his Buddy Guy's Legend t-shirt that my brother got me while he was away in Chicago a few years prior and I wore it to death. I used to have that on all of the time, especially if you go back to the old videos on the channel. You'll see me wearing that to no end, but I had a chance to wear that to his show and he was kind of confused, like, what are you doing with one of those on? So he gave me one of his electric guitar picks and I still have that to this day, which is awesome. Right after the show, I had a chance to meet Buddy Guy's sidekick guitarist, whose name is Rick Hall. Now, Rick Hall is the band's orchestrator. I think along with the drummer, they all give each other musical cues and they know exactly where the band is going at any particular time. At the time I got to see Buddy Guy, I was kind of losing interest in blues, believe it or not. I saw my guitar hero and they always say, never put your guitar heroes up on a pedestal, but I had a chance to see one of them who's a much bigger sort of household name than Buddy Guy. The Buddy Guy show wiped the floor with this other show and it re-energized my love for electric guitar and blues. So I was extremely motivated and one of the things I've always done every few years when I had an opportunity to was to travel overseas and this particular journey took me to Chicago. Now there's a number of reasons why I wanted to go to Chicago and this stems from watching a lot of my favorite movies as a kid that are set in Chicago, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Running Scared and a multitude of others but also the music of course. I got to go downtown, I got to see the Sears Tower, I got to see a lot of landmarks I've seen in movies for years. I got to have a Giordano's pizza, which was pretty cool too. And then I found my way towards Buddy Guy's Legends. So I walked in, had a good look around, and it was a pretty cool place, you know? I think sometimes when you see these places in videos or whatever the case may be, you expect them to be much larger. It was a relatively mid-sized venue, which kind of surprised me, but at the time, it had a lot of mojo, and I remember seeing the menu. There was a lot of soul food and stuff listed out that looked super cool. And I just had lunch, but I forced myself to have another meal. But it was great, and I didn't finish much of it, but it was really cool. While I was sitting there eating, I saw Rick Hall come in, and I kind of waved at him, and he kind of looked at me like, oh, you look familiar, but, you know, he meets a lot of people, obviously. So anyway, I went up to him. I said, hey, I met you in Melbourne a couple of, I think it was like three months ago or something like that. I don't know if you remember, but I took a photo with you at the back of the venue. And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. I looked you up and all that kind of stuff in the, uh, I think back in the MySpace days, right? He goes, oh, you're a good player. So, you know, keep it up or, you know, gave me some encouragement, which was super cool. And that was awesome. So I said to him, hey, is there any blues jams here tonight? I'm in town for like three days. Where can I play? And he basically said to me, look, there's nothing here until I think Thursday nights was the jam at Buddy Guys. I could be wrong. It was something like that. And I was there like on a Monday. So he said, yeah, I'll, get, I'll call around and I'll see if I can get you to play with someone that I know. So he's called around, done all kinds of things. And eventually he gave me a place to go play. Little did I know at the time, this cab ride was going to cost me about 160 US dollars return, right? So it was so expensive to go to this bowling alley and play. But I thought, why not? I'm only here for a few days. I might as well go do it. That's the kind of blues desperado that I am. So one thing led to another. I get in there and the cab driver says, well, you got to come back to your hotel, right? Which was like already 45 minutes out of the city. I said, yeah, I do. He goes, I'm just going to stay here, here and watch you play, right? I said, okay, cool. So he ended up staying the whole night. The host of the Blues Jam, his name was John Jewell. He's passed away, unfortunately. Really sad news when I heard that. The first thing I noticed was how different these type of blues jams were compared to the ones that I'm used to here in Melbourne. For starters, there were real deal singers that could just sing their ass off. It was great. A whole different caliber of vocals. 
The next thing that I noticed is the band. You know, there was percussion, there was bass, there was a few different guitars. It had just about everything going on on, on stage that you could ask for. So. Yeah, it was a super cool atmosphere. It was funny because I thought for, for some reason it was going to be packed, but it wasn't. It was just very similar in that regard to a lot of the blues jams here in Melbourne. But again, it was an opportunity to play, and I never pass that up if I get a chance to, especially when I travel. It's something that I'll always remember. Now, John was fantastic. He let me play pretty much most of the night. He gave me like, I think, eight songs in a row. A lot of the guys that were at the jam were so nice. I got to use this Chicago, I think it was called a blues box amplifier with some overdrive pedal that a guy had. I just picked up a Mexican Strat in Austin, Texas that I ended up using. I think I returned it in Chicago because it had a faulty jack at a guitar center. Grabbed another one and took it to the jam and I literally had all the same strings on there and everything. I had a little gig bag, couple of cables, no amp, no pedals, and that was it. And these guys were nice enough to let me use their stuff and let me jam. What would happen next was something very unexpected. A guy called Sammy Fender walked in who's been a great musician for many, many years. You should look him up. Phenomenal player, and I got a chance to play with him for about four or five songs, and I knew a lot of those songs from the open mic nights here in Melbourne. Up until now, I'd never played blues in a blues club in the US, so for me, this was a huge big deal, and I tried my best, and it was one of those moments where I was really inspired. Now, Sammy Fender, He's got a great vocal. He can stand five feet back from the microphone. He plays with great attack. He's got the bends. He's got the feel. He's got the tone. He just was killing it on stage, and I was really nervous playing with him. You know, being a guy from Australia, I was like, oh, hopefully this goes over okay. And he let me play, and he let me play. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the footage I had from that night, the camera got knocked, and it didn't see any of it. But there was a moment where someone in the crowd noticed that the camera wasn't straight, and they turned it around. And I want to show you that right now. Shane, huh? Shane, 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 Shane,
Sammy, 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 when it came to playing live, this is easily one of the most defining moments for me personally. Sammy was very gracious. He let me play and play and play. And I was running out of chops, but I was digging in and trying to make the most of it. He said to me on stage that, you know, my approach was great. But afterwards as well, he said, I can hear all of your influences and you play a very traditional approach. And he said also, this is very common of people from overseas, which I kind of liked as well. So that's pulling from the English players a lot, you know, the Claptons and so forth, but also listening to a lot of the Americans and what comes out of it is, I guess, a different feel, but maybe more inherently in the classic step of blues. So at the end of the day, this really changed the way I heard my own playing and it gave me so much more confidence knowing at least hopefully I was on the right path at that time. It's easy to go off the rails, but this is <laughs> something that really inspired me to keep playing blues. So Sammy Fender, thank you so much. John, thank you.